that they're going to give money for the maintenance, and then tomorrow they won't for a very, very good reason in their minds, and it probably was a good reason, right? So designing a park that has dedicated revenue stream um, in its plan, I still think is a great idea. Listen, this is this park was designed with that in mind. This, this is not a zero maintenance park, right, guys? No. <laughs> right, Rebecca. <laughs> This, as we stand in a, in a grove of bamboo, uh, you know that this is not a zero maintenance park. And it was, design I went through, me and all of everybody that helped, went through a, a lot of pain selling this idea in the public realm, public officials and public meetings and everything, knowing that we could make something better than ordinary by having that. The maintenance was the most important thing to us. It was a very complicated commission, and we want, we're asked to design a park, design a maintenance plan for the park, figure out how much the park would cost to maintain, and you know, what the maintenance plan would be, which we worked with Signe Nielsen on, by the way, just so you know, um, and, um, and then design the urban design plan that becomes the edges of the park that will include the revenue generating uses, working with all of the people that know how to figure that out, to cover that cost. It was like 10 balls in the air at the same time in public, you know? Like if I could have done that in like a nice smoke-filled room, that would have been fun. But in fact, it was much better that it was done in public, right? So there was a lot of talking about it and discussing it. Concept, you know, all of Jane Jacobs' observations that you need eyes on the park for it to, to be a successful park. All of these things came in to the, to the conversation, you know, and, um, and you know, it's still not, that building is supporting what's here now in terms of revenue, um, and it's not sold completely by a long shot, and we're in a tough economy for selling condos and stuff like that, but um, I do believe it will be a good model um, for, especially for a site that some of which could be a park, which is how this is. By the way, the basic premise we were given was that we could use 20% of the area to be the revenue generating use here. That was the premise that the community worked out with the politicians when the Port Authority was going to develop this land as housing because they thought they were doing the responsible thing. They had land that they were stewards of. They would develop it, make revenue, right, for the public good and for themselves, of course. And the city and the community said that's a bad idea that you shouldn't do that you should make mostly a park and then the establishment park establishment basically said but we can't take care of the parks that we have in Brooklyn now people and then the community said we still need a park how about if you use some of this area for revenue generating use and then support the rest of the park now of course they had the numbers all wrong in the beginning because that's what happens, right? So all the numbers were too low, right? Surprise, surprise, right? So they thought they were going to do it for much less than it actually cost. So then we had real professionals work on it based on real engineering plans and real analysis of the wooden piles and every other real hard thing that they never could have known about. And their estimate was off by, by three. Right? They thought it was $5 million, and we figured out it was $15 million. Mm. So they thought, ah, philanthropy. We thought, come on, you can't ask people for $15 million in Brooklyn a year to take care of this. Come on already, grow up. Huh? I didn't say grow up. I wanted to say that a lot, okay? I didn't say it. So, so you know, we worked this out with a million consultants, real estate consultants and everybody else, right? And, you know, I went up and... and in the whole rooms of 300 people with people that wanted to throw rotten tomatoes at me because they're idealists who think that we should just make a park and the government should just pay for the maintenance. And then they hold up as examples of what they want me to do parks that are not maintained that way, that are all maintained by conservancies, every one of them. I want that thing they have in Central Park. Oh, you mean the park maintained by the Central Park, rescued by the Central Park Conservancy? I want that thing they have in Bryan Park. Oh, you mean the thing that's operated by the Bryan Park bid? 
I want that thing they have in Prospect Park. Oh, you mean the thing that's operated by the Prospect Park Conservancy? I want the thing that they have in Union Square Park. Oh, you mean the thing that's operated by the Union Square Partnership? Every sing I want the thing they have in Hudson River Park. Oh, the thing that's operated by the Hudson River Park Trust? Every single park is, there is government partnership in there, right? But it's not purely just on the dole of the tax money, right? And I personally feel that that is, this process is a more democratic process. The decisions of the operating of this park, even, you know, how it will be maintained, is going to have more direct democratic feedback, more people that aren't just the bureaucracy, whatever that is, are going to be involved in the process in doing that, right? Um, and there's all aspects to that, you know? The parts of Central Park that were near the richest neighborhoods got restored first. That's true. They also are the areas that get used the most, too, uh, on the southern end, right? And, in fact, you know, they took a lot of pride in restoring the mirror, for instance. It was all the way up in Harlem very early on. So you could leverage that early work to later work as well. So you can tell I'm kind of strong, feel strong about this. Okay, start drinking. Let's